This is VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program... Katie Weaver has a story on Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day in the United States. Mario Ritter Jr. reports on China's plans to increase the size of its space station. Brian Lynn brings us the science report on a NASA spacecraft launched to study a metal asteroid. Later, Andrew Smith and Jill Robbins. Present the English lesson of the day, but first, this Monday is Columbus Day in the United States. The U.S. government established Columbus Day as a national holiday in 1934 to honor the explorer Christopher Columbus. The day recognizes Columbus's arrival in the Americas in October 1492. Recently, critics have said that Columbus did not discover America, since native people already lived there. His explorations helped open the way for a huge migration of Europeans to what they called. The New World. This brought war, disease, and death to many native peoples. Some American states have since moved away from honoring Columbus and instead observe a day for Native American people. In 2021, President Joe Biden issued the first ever presidential proclamation. Of Indigenous Peoples Day, the day is to be celebrated along with Columbus Day. The May 2020 death of George Floyd, an unarmed black man in the state of Minnesota, led to nationwide protests against police use of force and racial injustice. Protesters directed some of their anger at statues and monuments honoring Confederate officials from the American Civil War. Many cities then removed the statues and monuments said to be connected to racial injustice, racism, and slavery. The anger led to protest attacks on memorials to Columbus around the country. Statues of the explorer were taken down in Boston, Chicago, and many other cities. In the Rhode Island capital of Providence, a statue of Christopher Columbus was also removed in June 2020. The removal came after protesters covered it with red paint and a sign reading "Stop Celebrating Genocide." The statue was placed in storage and then purchased for about fifty thousand dollars by former Providence Mayor Joseph Paolino. After three years out of the public eye, the statue will return to a park in the city of Johnston, about fourteen kilometers west of the capital. The statue will be officially uncovered. On Monday, Johnston Mayor Joseph Palacina Jr. said people of his heavily Italian American town are pleased to give the statue a new home. It's important, and not just for Italian Americans. It's American history. It's world history if you look at it from a historical perspective. He said, "People should learn about him." The good and the bad. 
Not everyone is happy with the return of the Explorer's statue. Harrison Tuttle is president of Black Lives Matter Rhode Island PAC. Tuttle said he understands the connection that many of Italian ancestry feel for Columbus. But he wished the mayor had spoken with members of the community who were offended by the decision to return the statue. My grandmother, who helped raise me, was Italian, and I grew up in a majority Italian neighborhood, he said. At the same time, there are better ways to celebrate your heritage and culture without celebrating someone who, in my opinion, is the exact opposite of what Italian culture is. Daryl Waldron, director of the Rhode Island Indian Council, is the son of a Narragansett father and a Wampanoag mother. He said he and others hoped that the statue would have been sold off and kept out of public view, with money going toward a new statue. I'm Katie Weaver. China plans to increase the size of its space station in the coming years. The station will offer astronauts from other countries a different choice for near-Earth missions. The International Space Station, ISS, led by NASA, is nearing the end of its service life. The China Academy of Space Technology, CAST, said the operational lifetime of the Chinese space station will be more than 15 years. The organization is China's main space contractor. Chinese officials made the estimate recently at the 74th International Astronautical Congress in Baku, Azerbaijan. The new operational lifetime would be more than the ten years announced earlier. China's space station, known as Tiangong, or the Celestial Palace in Chinese, has been operational since late 2022. It holds up to three astronauts and orbits 450 kilometers above Earth. After an increase from three to six modules, Tiangong will be about 180 metric tons. Tiangong is 40% of the mass of the ISS, which can hold a crew of seven astronauts. But the ISS, in orbit for more than 20 years, is expected to stop service after 2030. China has said it expects to become a major space power. Chinese state media said last year, as Tiangong became fully operational, that China would be no slouch as the ISS headed toward retirement. State media added that several countries had asked to send their astronauts to the Chinese station. But the European Space Agency, ESA, said this year it did not have the financial or political approval to take part in Tiangong. The announcement suspended a plan that had been developed over years for a visit by European astronauts. The Global Times, a newspaper linked to the Chinese Communist Party, wrote at the time, 
giving up cooperation with China in the manned space domain is clearly short-sighted, which reveals that the U.S.-led camp confrontation has led to a new space race. Tiangong has become a symbol of China's growing influence and belief in its space missions. U.S. law bans China from any work, direct or indirect, with NASA. Russia is highly involved in the ISS and has similar space diplomacy plans. Russia suggested that its partners in the BRICS group, Brazil, India, China, and South Africa, could build a module for its new space station. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. The American Space Agency, NASA, is preparing to launch a spacecraft designed to observe an asteroid made mostly of metal. The launch of the vehicle, called Psyche, is set for October 12th from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The spacecraft will fly to an asteroid also called Psyche, it orbits the Sun between Mars and Jupiter. NASA says the asteroid was discovered by an Italian astronomer in 1852. Since it was the 16th asteroid discovered, it is sometimes also called 16 Psyche. Psyche will be NASA's first trip or mission to an asteroid that contains a large amount of metal. Past missions explored asteroids made mostly of rock or ice. Astronomers say the asteroid Psyche is about 280 kilometers at its widest point. They believe it may be part of a center or core of a planetesimal. This is an object thought to be the metallic remains of an early rocky planet. Scientists think Psyche is made up mostly of iron and nickel, similar to Earth's center. NASA believes the asteroid could have separated during violent crashes that happened during our solar system's early creation. Scientists think data collected on the asteroid could provide new details about how rocky planets, including Earth, formed. But NASA says the object could also turn out to be something else— such as a different kind of iron-rich body that formed from metal-rich material somewhere in the solar system. The space agency expects Psyche to travel about 3.6 billion kilometers over six years to reach the asteroid. If the spacecraft reaches its target as planned in August 2029, it will then start orbiting the object for at least two years. Once in orbit, the mission team will examine data gathered by several science instruments aboard the spacecraft. Psyche will take pictures map the asteroid's surface, and collect data on what materials are contained in the object. NASA says once Psyche separates from its launch vehicle, 
It will use a different kind of propulsion system never tried in missions beyond the moon. The system to be used is called solar electric propulsion. Large solar panels will be extended outward from the main part of the spacecraft to collect light from the sun. The panels then change or convert this sunlight into electricity that powers the spacecraft's thrusters. Psyche will depend on solar electric propulsion to reach its target. NASA describes the thrust as gentle but strong enough to push the spacecraft through its long trip. The spacecraft is also set to get a gravitational push when it passes by Mars in May 2026. NASA said experiments have shown that solar electric propulsion can be highly effective. Scientists estimate Psyche's thrusters could operate nearly non-stop for years without running out of fuel. In addition, NASA says Psyche will be carrying nearly 1,000 kilograms of propellant, xenon gas, in its tanks. Xenon is also used in automobile headlights and some televisions. Agency engineers have estimated the mission would need to burn through about 15 times that amount of propellant if the Psyche spacecraft used traditional chemical thrusters. Lindy Elkins Tanton with Arizona State University is the lead investigator for the mission. She said NASA had always planned on having Psyche use an electric propulsion system. Without it, we wouldn't have the Psyche mission, Elkins Tanton said. NASA says the Psyche mission also includes a technology demonstration involving a laser-based data communications system. This experiment is designed to test the ability of lasers to transmit data at increased rates beyond the moon. The technology to be tested in the demonstration is known as optical communications. It is meant to one day replace the radio communication systems long used by NASA to transmit data between Earth and space. NASA says a laser-based communication method will permit the agency to send and receive data faster and more effectively. I'm Brian Lynn. Brian Lynn joins me now to talk more about his science report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Of course, Dan. Glad to be here. In this week's report, you previewed an upcoming NASA mission that will send a spacecraft to study a metal asteroid. This is one of several NASA projects involving asteroids, right? Yes. In fact, just a few weeks ago, we reported on a NASA mission that returned the first samples collected from a distant asteroid in 2020. They were dropped in the Utah desert by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, and about one year ago, the DART spacecraft crashed into an asteroid in a planetary defense experiment. And another one, the agency's Lucy spacecraft, launched about two years ago. It aims to observe eight different asteroids over a 12-year period. Why do you think NASA is so interested in studying asteroids right now? Well, it does certainly seem like NASA has been putting more resources into asteroid exploration. Uh, in the case of the DART mission, space officials said it was clearly a test of whether a spacecraft could change the path of an asteroid that might threaten Earth. And that experiment showed a spacecraft can do this 
and NASA plans similar tests in the future. Thanks again for answering my questions, Brian. Sure, Dan. Thank you. And my name is Jill Robbins. And I'm Andrew Smith. You're listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our series, Let's Learn English. This series shows Ana Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C. In Lesson 18... Anna tries something new at work, reading the news. Her boss, Miss Weaver, is coaching her on how a professional journalist should read. She wants Anna to give the facts without showing any emotion. <laughs> but we all know Anna. It's hard for her to do that because she becomes so excited about each story she reads. Let's hear some of the lesson. Hello from Washington, D.C. Today at work, I am reading the news for the first time. I am really nervous, but my boss, Ms. Weaver, is here to help me. Now, Anna, remember, when we read the news, we are always reading facts. We never show our feelings. Sure thing, Ms. Weaver. Great. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Let's try the first story. Hello, and welcome to the news. A new book is very popular with children and families. This is it. It is about a lost duckling. The duck's mother cannot find him. Stop. Anna? When you say the words duck and duckling, you look really sad. I do? Yes. Sad is a feeling. Sad is not a fact. Sorry. Let me try again. I see. Ms. Weaver is trying to teach Anna to read objectively. That means to tell the facts without adding your own feelings. Anna shows her feelings both in her face and in her voice. Andrew, you know, our listeners might think the opposite of the adjective objective is subjective. In some cases, that's true. But there's another word we use when we talk about reporting news. When someone presents the news in a way that makes it seem worse or more shocking than it really is, we call it sensationalist. Subjective means we show our personal feelings or opinions about something. When we do that with the news and make everything seem terrible, you would call it sensationalist. Now I see why Ms. Weaver wants Anna to read the news objectively. Yes, we've all seen what happens when the news is sensationalized. People get worried. So Anna gives it another try. Let's listen and see if she can do it better the next time. Okay, she's trying again. And go. Hello and welcome to the news. A new book is very popular with children and families. This is it. It is about a lost duckling. The duck's mother cannot find him. But a family gives him a home. Stop, Anna. You are doing it again. This story is very sad. Well, that didn't go so well. Did you notice that Anna changed the way she said one word, him, the second time she read it? Listen to that again. The duck's mother cannot find him. I think that's because she's feeling so strongly about the story. 
but we hear a shorter form of pronouns quite often in American English. One example of shorter forms is that phrase we use to encourage someone trying something new. Go get them. Here, M is a short form of them. But we never shorten me, it, or us, because those words are already short. If I was in the studio with Anna, I'd tell her, go get them, when she tries reading the news again. Maybe she can get it right the third time. Let's find out if Miss Weaver gives her another chance on a different story. I have an idea. Let's read the second story. She's reading the second story and go. Okay, let's try the first story. She's reading the second story. Hello and welcome to the news. In Indiana, a grandmother is the first 80-year-old woman to win the race car 500. That is awesome. Stop. Stop. Anna, please. No feelings. Right. But it is awesome that an 80-year-old grandmother wins a car race. Just the facts, Anna. <sighs> right. Hello, and welcome to the news. In Indiana, a grandmother is the first 80-year-old woman to win the race car 500. She rarely talks to reporters, but when she does, she often says, nothing can stop me now. I am very happy for her. Stop, stop, stop. Anna, you cannot say you are happy. But I am happy. But you can't say it. Why? This is the news. Happy and sad are feelings. You can't have them in the news. <sighs> okay. I got it. There's another useful expression. Anna says, I got it, to show she understands Ms. Weaver. It's a little informal, and it's a shorter form of, I have got it. If you listen to the rest of the story, you'll find that she finally does understand what Miss Weaver's trying to teach her. And her boss uses the same expression, too. What can I do, Miss Weaver? Take out my feelings and put them here on the news desk? Yes! Yes! That's right! Now you've got it! Once again, I'm Andrew Smith, and you're listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English podcast. To review, we've learned some short forms for pronouns like im or m. Can you think of any others, Andrew? There are situations when I don't know someone's gender. That is, I don't know if they are male or female. So I say something like, I'll give it to him. I think there's just enough time for a little chant with our reduced pronoun forms. Are you ready, Jill? Let's give it to him. <laughs> Listeners, try to repeat after we say the lines. Can you find him? I can't find him. Can you see her? I can't see her. Did you tell them? I didn't tell him. Did you get it? I got it. Well, that's all for the lesson of the day today. You can learn more on our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. And thanks for listening to the Learning English Podcast. I'm Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.